Hi, welcome back again with another episode of a community spotlight of a prominent physician within the Phoenix, Arizona uh, area. I'm Drew Giardina with Total Sports Therapy, and I'm joined today by Dr. Anakar Chabra. Uh, he is the chair of the sports medicine program at Mayo Clinic in Phoenix, as well as uh, a professor of orthopedics within the Mayo School of Medicine. Correct. Uh, thank you for joining us. Great to be here. Um, so uh, what we're doing is we've, we've kind of got a spotlight of physicians we're doing to uh, on post to our YouTube channel, mm -hmm. uh, prominent physicians that we find specialists in the, in the area within the greater Phoenix area. And uh, we'll just kind of delve right into it. Uh, what, what, what got you initially interested in going into medicine? Sure, so I grew up, uh, my dad is a pediatrician. So I, as a child of a physician, you know, that's all I knew growing up. Uh, dad would be at the office, he'd take us into the hospital with him to do rounds and uh, it was sort of instilled in us that you know you have to be a service person throughout your life and so being a physician I was always sort of pushed in that direction. As I went throughout my high school and college career it was always in the back of my mind. I actually thought I was going to go into business. I was an economics major in college at Harvard and uh, I worked on Wall Street for three summers and my third summer on Wall Street, I realized that, that this isn't for me. I felt like, um, you know, it was very stressful working with other people's money, especially when you didn't have much control over it. I learned a lot about the markets and, and um, it, uh, it wasn't for me. It just didn't, I didn't think I'd be happy. So I sort of pivoted there and went back to medicine. I'd been preparing for that my whole college career, taking my pre-med recs and uh, it sort of solidified my decision. Once I got, to, uh, got made that decision, orthopedics was really an easy choice. Uh, my older brother is an orthopedic surgeon in Virginia, so he was three years ahead of me. So he was a big mentor for me uh, in terms of my field choice and, and uh, going into orthopedics. Nice. And then at what point did you transition out to, out to Arizona? So uh, just like all uh, most of us have, I followed my wife. <laughs> uh, she's from Arizona. Uh, she was actually born in India, but moved here when she was uh, a very young age. And she actually trained in, she's an ASU alum, went to Tempe High, ASU alum, uh, medical school in California, and then did her uh, residency training out at uh, U of A in Tucson. So she wanted to come back here. And so we got married during my fellowship year and uh, moved out here. Uh, that was 15 years, uh, 16 years ago in 2005. So I started out here in the Valley. Okay. Yeah, and you, I know you, you, you Played ball at Harvard, yep, correct? Played basketball for four years at Harvard. Uh, I loved it. Great. It was a great uh, mix of academics and athletics at a high level. Uh, really have some close friends from, from that time. As you know, your teammates are guys that you'll be, uh, be around and lead on the rest of your life, so still very close. I wouldn't trade it for the world. I love my experience playing college basketball. It also, I think, helps me now with what I do with sports medicine. I'm able to relate to a lot of athletes. I've been there. I've had a lot of injuries myself. I've blown my knees out, and so I know what it's like from both sides of the table, being a patient as well as a surgeon, and I think it helps me relate to, to athletes of all levels. Yeah, I, I you know, in the phys physical therapy realm that I'm in, it's, it's having been an athlete, mm -hmm. um, understanding movement patterns, 100%. Um, you know, sports-specific yeah. kind of things to get people prepared for what they got to get back to doing. 100%, and yeah. understanding how to talk to the athletes, how to talk to the trainers, how to talk to the coaches how to talk to the parents. I think having been there, it, it makes it a lot easier. And it, it does, the, the, the patients do look at you with a little bit more respect because they know you've been there. Yeah, so uh, I, that, absolutely. When you can speak the talk, you know, <laughs> when you talk the talk, it, it makes it a little bit easier. Um, along those lines, what, what would you, um, in terms of your specialty within orthopedics, what yeah. so people know kind of what you typically are working with as far as surgeries, sure. injuries, that kind of thing. So, so my training has a lot to do with where I, I ended up. Uh, I uh, did residency at University of Virginia, uh, where I was actively involved in taking care of their sports teams. I, I went and did a sports medicine fellowship at the University of Pittsburgh. It's a, it was a sports medicine arthroscopy and the knee and shoulder fellowship, and so. Uh, I got to work with some great mentors at Pittsburgh, Dr. Freddie Fu, Dr. Chris Harner, Dr. Uh, Jim Bradley. They're close friends of mine and great mentors, and I've modeled a lot of what I do out, out of obviously where you trained and who, who influenced you. So my practice has sort of morphed as I've become more mature in my practice. I do a lot of athletes, but not only high-level athletes, but also recreational athletes of all ages. I, I take care of kids all the way up to 70, 80-year-olds. 
uh, and we take care of all sports injuries. If I had to tell you what I'm most passionate about, it'd be the knee. I'm a, I'm a knee specialist. I do a, a lot of complex knee work, uh, meniscal allograft transplants, osteochondral allograft transplants, cartilage restoration procedures, osteotomies, obviously multi-ligaments and ACL reconstructions. You know, I, I'm passionate about the knee. I love the knee joint. And uh, I do all sports stuff from ankles to shoulders to elbows. But if I had to pick one thing that I'd want to do, it'd be, it'd be a complex knee reconstruction. Oh, okay. Well, that's a fair amount of recovery after something like that. Yep, uh, and we, we depend on you and the therapist for good good results. So uh, I think uh, it's great to have a great relationship with therapists uh, like yourself who understand uh, the importance of the right rehab protocols and how to relate to the patients and how to, how to make them understand that this is a long process. And in today's world where everybody wants a quick fix and wants to be back right away and and to not put in the work and the time it doesn't work that way. So, yeah, you know, and 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 not to try to pigeonhole, you know, what he's what he's talking about as far as I know, you know, the name of our clinic is Total Sports Therapy, and, mm-hmm. and you know, we get some phone calls periodically from from patients like, you know, all you do is deal with athletes, yeah. and and you know, uh, the first thing I tell them is like, well, first off, no, but. Um, that's the cool thing about this valley is it's a very active older population too. Yeah. I mean, it's as far as trying to hold back people that are trying to do too much a little too quickly. It's yeah. it's honestly the 50 and over tennis and golf you yeah. know, person. 100%. Trying, you know, they've got the time to devote to getting better, and sometimes right. you got to go, okay, slow down. So it's yeah. you know while we see athletes, it's certainly not our only yeah. demographic that we treat. So. Yeah. so as you know, I'm I've been the head ortho at ASU now for six uh, since 2007. So that's what 14 years running. Uh, where we take care of all the athletes, and everybody thinks that that's all I take care of. No, that's that's a small part of my practice. You know, our group here at Mayo, we take care of the Coyotes, we take care of the Phoenix Rising. But to be honest with you, I love taking care of the high school kids. We have 18 high schools we take care of. Uh, but despite all those those um, teams we take care of, the majority of our patients we see are the recreational athletes. If you're trying to go out for a run or go play with your dog you know you're that's just as important as if you're trying to go uh, play on a professional baseball team as far as we're concerned you know you got to get your life back and so we treat every patient regardless of what team or what level you're at the same you know because everybody deserves to get their life back and be active so whether it's going out and playing softball with the guys or or going to play you know in the nba you know we feel like we can provide the same level of care yeah so good point uh, what would you, so I've asked uh, everybody that I've been able to, fortunate to talk to um, this question. If you, if you had somebody coming to you, possibly interested in getting into medicine, yeah. um, uh, what would your recommendations be to those people in terms of um, what would be important to, 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 to yeah. keep in mind the whole, the whole time? Yeah, no, um, and we do. I, this happens every day. We have a Mayo Med School here that started four years ago, so we have medical school rotators. And I'm pretty actively involved with ASU undergrad um, um, pre-med group uh, where I give lectures to, and and I get a lot of these same questions. So the first thing you gotta decide is medicine's not for everybody. Um, It's not just a job. It's really a life uh, that it's all encompassing. And you do have to make sacrifices to be be a doctor, be a physician, and be in the medical field because when people get hurt, they're gonna come to you at all hours of the day and they're gonna depend on you. And you have to make sacrifices of, uh, uh, of you know, what you're going to give up in order to be successful at your job. Having said that, though, I tell people it's the best job in the world. I get to come to work and I go to games for work. I get to help people every day. No day, day is the same. I get to fix things. I love fixing things with my hands. I love to see patients get back to what they love to do. There's so much gratitude that they have towards me and my staff on a day-to-day basis. So it's a very fulfilling job and, it, and I'm never bored. I love coming to work every day. And uh, I tell you, it's an exciting way uh, to live. And uh, it's, it's, you gotta make sure you keep your priorities and keep your balance. You know, I'm a husband and I'm a father and you gotta make sure that you keep those priorities and don't lose sight of that because it's very easy to get sucked into your job and neglect those other obligations you have. So. Keep your priorities straight, but make sure that uh, um, that you're ready for sort of the the ups and downs. Medicine's not always perfect. You know, you're going to have bad results. You're going to need to help people through tough times, and so it, it makes it for a really exciting job. 
the people who want to go into medicine, it's so service oriented. And, and in today's world, it's such a great way to spend your days. It, yeah, it's, it, it's uh, I mean, I find a lot of times at the end of the day, from a long, long day of working with people, you have some physical fatigue, but mm -hmm. you know, when in the, in the, in the PT realm that I'm dealing with, it's, we, we have a little more face time typically yeah. in a day with a yeah. person and uh, being able to talk to people and talk people through all of their questions and I mean, the personal relationship that I've established with patients is really a, some of the biggest part of getting somebody from from injury to recovery, and, because it's yep. such a commitment to come and you know it's a commitment to just to get better. You know, they they got their visits right. with you as a surgeon, but then you've got to do all this. You have to do all the therapy, and uh, you know the best therapists that I've been around obviously have the skill set. Um, but sure. they also know how to talk to people. And, and, and I tell you, that's the same for the best physicians I've been around. You have to have, build a rapport and you, you know, we don't have much time for a patient to be, get confident in you because you see them for a visit 15, 20, 25 minutes in the office and they're basically giving their livelihood to you to take care of. And so you have to be able to communicate and talk to them uh, in a way that they understand and to answer their questions in a short period of time and really to make them feel comfortable. So communication and relationships are really, uh, as you said, they're, they're the key to being successful. So uh, uh, along the orthopedic surgery realm, is you see is anything new that you that you see yeah. that's coming into, into play as far as surgical I, techniques? I think, or? yeah, I think um, we're getting better. We're refining our techniques, and I think our rehab protocols are becoming more accelerated. And you can just see what we've done over the last 10 years in terms of simple procedures like an ACL reconstruction. I mean, some people won't consider that simple. It's a big, big deal, but you know, we do a lot of them and the accelerated rehab protocols from them, the different techniques uh, from you know, how we drill our tunnels, uh, the different type of fixation methods, they're all only making it better. Having said that though, it still comes down to when is somebody functionally ready to go back? So it comes back to the rehab side of it. I think that's been the biggest advance with ACL surgery in the last 10 years is how we treat them after surgery. When do we let them go back to play? What sort of functional testing do we do? That's from that standpoint. If you, if you think about orthopedics in general and muscle, muscle uh, and tendon and ligament healing, you can't have that conversation without talking about biologics, without talking about PRP and stem cells. That, you know, and we get those questions. I'll get the questions 20 times a day when I have a clinic day. Is, hey doc, can you just inject some stem cells? Um, we're getting a lot more literature, mainly on the PRP side, uh, and we're starting to use that in mainstream orthopedics now for arthritis, for ligament and tendon tears. Those are things that we offer here. We do those under ultrasound. But it's, it's also uh, something you've got to be cautious to use. A lot of people come in and think it's a quick fix. What people don't realize is that's just going to augment your healing process by increasing the blood flow and increasing the inflammatory process. You still have to go through the rehab process. You still have to go through the limitations after that. It's not going to be better. It's not a quick fix where you're going to be better immediately. People always come in and talk about stem cells. Uh, and we're talking about stem cells that are, the definition of stem cells is something that's been modified in the lab. So we're not talking about adipose or uh, bone marrow aspirate because those are from yourself that have a very low concentration of stem cells. We're talking about things that have been modified in the lab. That's the true definition of a true stem cell. They're very expensive and they haven't really been proven yet in the orthopedic world to do what we, what is being claimed. They're about, they're about I think 50 or 52 stem cell clinics in Arizona right now. And they're offering and marketing these uh, stem cells as the cure-all for arthritis and for te meniscal tears and for rotator cuff tears. Unfortunately, that hasn't been proven in the science, so be cautious when it comes to stem cells and make sure that we get more literature on it. So doing uh, the right research um, before using them in clinical practice is sort of what we're focused on here at Mayo. Yeah, I, it's, I literally got a question about stem cells yesterday from a patient, yeah. and um, I haven't seen a ton of it, and, I, and yeah. I, you know, it, it, the results of what I've seen haven't been certainly earth shattering in it. In no, and capacity. I think people, it's, it's media and marketing are driving it right now. Uh, and the thing, they hear professional athletes go to Europe and get stem cells where there's not much regulation. Uh, there's not an FDA there, so they can use them a little bit more freely. And so people think that that's, that they're going to get it, so it must work without the science being there. And so the problem with stem cells, there's so many different preparations, there's so many different types, there's so many different quantities of cells, there are different st cell lines. Um, and 
you can't just lump them all together in one term like they've been lumped and say, okay, they're going to work for knee arthritis. They're going to be, I think they will work in the future. We just have to figure out which lines, at what concentration, at what, from what source. Uh, I think all those things we haven't figured out yet. It's very similar to the PRP world where people use them for everything way back when. And it's only, it's taken 10, 15 years to figure out the exact quantities and what type of PRP works for different pathologies. So I think the research is lagging behind the use. And um, until we can get the right studies out there, um, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely going to continue to lag behind. So we need to figure that out before we can really start to help patients. So being at a place like Mayo Clinic is one of the reasons I moved here from private practice to be able to do that research and be able to uh, be involved at a much bigger scale than just taking care of patients. So to, to do research that can influence a lot more people is pretty exciting. So those are things we're working on here. Okay. So the kind of throwing the off the wall question at you here. Uh -oh. I'll try to do one of these for, for each one of the people we're interviewing. If you had in a, in a life threatening situation, if you had to go up against a shark or a grizzly bear, uh -huh. which one of those do you think you, you, would, you would choose? A grizzly bear, because I'm not as good of a swimmer. <laughs> <laughs> Makes it easy, that's an easy question. <laughs> So. It's, yeah, I ask a lot of patients those questions too, and everybody's kind of got a different philosophy. You know, yeah. Some people think a shark has a little more vulnerability, vulnerable spots to them. So maybe, but, but I, I don't think I could swim enough to find those vulnerable spots. Uh, yeah, enough, no, so I think I take my chance be, running, even though yeah, they run I know me down. exactly. I think you could run and hide a little bit different, and maybe distract the grizzly bear a little bit more. If the, so. DiCaprio can beat one. I mean, I, I know, I know, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of big. Maybe I'll scare a grizzly bear a little bit more <laughs> than a shark. Um, uh, just due to the times that we're dealing with now, um, what would you, you know, if patients that maybe have a little apprehension about coming yeah. into the hospital situation or to, to come see you due to COVID? Yeah, you know? I think the last year was a very trying year. Uh, Mayo, I was really excited and happy to be at a place like Mayo Clinic where we have the world leaders in infectious disease and epidemiology right here working on our campus. Uh, we've done everything we can to keep patients safe. And what I tell even my family members, the hospital is probably one of the safest places you can be uh, because everybody's screened, because the physicians and all the people we work with are vaccinated and uh, we're taking the necessary precautions with social distancing and PPE and we're wearing masks and gloves all the time. Um, I think I feel pretty safe being here. Most patients now uh, realize as they're getting out in the community, uh, it's it's safe. Uh, it's safe to be out as long as you take the right precautions. You know, mask. We're still masking. Uh, obviously, when we see patients every day, we mask all around the hospital. It's still a requirement here, uh, despite some of the restrictions being lifted in town. We still think that's important until we we're sure that there's not going to be another spike. Um, it was a trying year last year. I mean, uh, yeah, everybody, the testing protocols and you know, having to be quarantined and when people get, you know, feel sick, you know, the precautions you have to take, you know, whether you're seeing them in clinic or whether you're operating on them, it was tough, but I think uh, it made us better physicians. It's really opened up a lot of different avenues of us taking care of patients. Virtual medicine's become a real big thing now, and we still do that now. And, and uh, patients, I think, have a better understanding of their own health and what they're looking for um, and they're taking better care of themselves. If you look at some of the, uh, the numbers that are starting to come out about the flu and things like that, their numbers are lower than they've ever been yeah. uh, because I think we're starting to learn how to take care of ourselves. And, and it's definitely um, changed how we think about things, but I think hopefully we're on the other side of it now and we don't see another big spike. But having said that, I think if we do, we're better prepared to handle it. Yeah, we, I mean, there's, there's, there's some things we've implemented within the clinic. Yeah. I mean, we're still wearing masks too. And, and yeah. in, until some of the CDC guidelines change, there really isn't, I don't yeah. foresee that changing. And, no. and I don't, honestly, we, we're doing temperatures and uh, I don't know yeah. that we'll ever stop doing the temperatures. That's kind of handy for just identifying yeah. the flu. Yeah, hundred percent. I think, I think we're, we're better physicians because of it. It's, it's made us as orthopedic surgeons understand you know, the infectious disease side of things and the internal medicine side of things and think about those things that we never used to think about. So, um, yeah, it was a tough year, but I think I think we were able to get through it. And I think uh, we've in terms of the surgical procedures and things like that, I don't think it changed anything too much. It did make 
rehab a little bit harder when people couldn't get to the therapist. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think I think we're gonna learn from it and continue to improve. Sounds good. Okay, well we're gonna wrap it up. Um, keep keep watching. There'll be some information on the screen both regarding total sports therapy and how you can get in contact with Dr. Anakar Chabra. Uh, once again, thank you for joining us. That was great. Happy to happy to help anytime. Yeah, and we're gonna be. Uh, Keep an eye out uh, on our YouTube channel. We'll, we'll be doing more of these in the future. And um, appreciate you watching. Thank you.